Oh, it's been a hot minute, hasn't it? You know, when this all started back in January, I said something about staring too long into the abyss and how it could start to stare back at you. But at this point... I think I am the abyss. Well, I just spent over 40 minutes actually being positive about mascot horror for once, so thankfully the universe has noticed it so it could drop the fourth entry of True Peak. Garden of Ban Ban 4 is something I didn't even try to pretend like I wouldn't cover this time. After playing through 3 all the way back in May, this series has officially solidified itself as my absolute favorite guilty pleasure topic. With the direction that everything started to take, I was genuinely genuinely intrigued on what else could possibly happen at this point. With a huge fight at the end of the last game, putting most of the characters out of commission, and the tease of finally encountering characters that were teased all the way since 2, I couldn't possibly imagine what lunacy the Euphoric Brothers had in store for us. And despite everything that has already happened, I was still not prepared for the things that I was going to bear witness to. This time, not much has happened between the release of Ban Ban 3 and 4 for the most part. We got some Roblox ports as well as an RP game released, which both are interesting to say the least, but that's a topic and discussion for another day. Other than that, the brothers have still remained relatively quiet about their progress of the game, working away at it in the shadows. So, with expectations being completely up in the air, and this game being double the price of every other Ban Ban game so far, what could possibly be going on in Ban Ban's kindergarten this time? Well, there's only one way to find out, and it's to once again go deeper. Garden of Ban Ban 4, as per usual, starts with us on the elevator we ended the last chapter on. Appealing in hand, stepping off, we are then- Oh, I see how it's going to be. You know, this kindergarten is pretty friggin' unsafe if the monsters can easily break through metal doors like it's nothing. Where on earth would you even start if you were to be trampled by one of these guys? Well, good thing I have a pretty good idea, as this video is sponsored by Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm. Hey you! It's common knowledge that hiring a law firm is usually seen as daunting and headache-inducing. But Morgan & Morgan is able to help you make that process much more simple. Their services allowing you to submit a claim in just 8 clicks or less. With no need to visit any law offices or wait through long and tedious consultations. It is the definitive 21st century law firm, allowing you to do anything from signing contracts or uploading documents and medical records all from your cell phone. Or or even allowing you to be able to text your legal team and attorney throughout the duration of your case. And in the case of an injury, contacting Morgan & Morgan is a no-brainer and costs absolutely nothing unless they win. So don't overthink it. You can click the link in the description below and check out Morgan & Morgan today. Once again, thank you to Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring this video. Anyways, this starting environment is just awful, I'm sorry. We start off by getting chased by the big lizard from Chapter 3, and although I can understand why this game starts like this, and the introduction almost pays off at the end of a new gimmick they introduce, but it just feels like it's without warning at all. Especially when every other game before has started in a safe location. Also, this is like, the only notable chase of this chapter as well. There's kind of one at the end too, but it's so inconsequential with barely any threat threat that I don't even count it. The reason why the beginning of the game is so in your face though is because of the new mechanic they introduced with the appealing that started to accompany you since the end of 3. There's now these little buttons that you and the appealing have to stand on to open certain doors. Why is this something that is introduced this late in the game and in such specific areas? It's Ban Ban, don't question it. I get that they probably wanted to make the opener of the game feel like there's this sense of urgency, but once you get past this little gap in the wall, you can take as long as you want. Going up to Tamataki and Chamataki doesn't even hurt you either. You can just stare at them for as long as you want, and I think that's really funny. Though, if you do decide to actually continue the game, you're brought into one more room that utilizes this puzzle, which also includes the drone. But after that, you're brought into this very open room, and oh my god, you have to be fucking kidding me. Pack it up, fellas. Ban Ban has officially introduced an official content farm drone remote. 
remote. Worst part is that this is also the only time you will be seeing this remote, so we don't even know what it does. The reason being is because as soon as we try to interact with it, we are immediately knocked out and dragged away. So to all the content farms that will inevitably exploit this remote to absolute death until we figure out its actual use, hope you're eating good tonight. Waking up, we are interrogated by someone pretty special. Listen up, criminal. That whole act of you being unconscious won't work on me. Finally, it only took him two games since he was introduced, but Sheriff Toadster finally does something. The interrogation questions he asks are pretty simple, mostly consisting of asking if you did or did not encounter other characters from previous chapters. But something I actually find really funny and honestly kind of cool is the fact that you can just straight up lie to him without any consequence. The first time I played this, I assumed he'd just kill you if you didn't answer his questions correctly. But there are actually alternate lines of dialogue if you choose to lie instead, which I appreciate the effort for. On that note as well, this game finally has new voice talent. Sheriff Toadster's VA is honestly a real big highlight for the game as well. And really, all the new VAs the brothers got for this game are all pretty good. Right after the interrogation with Toadster, we get another example of this with the reveal of Queen Bouncelia, whose voice actor also does an incredibly good job bringing this character to life. And how would you rate the fruitfulness of that interrogation? She has a very posh, Victorian-era ruler voice, which fits well with the character. But of course, if anyone was going to fumble the characterization, it was going to be the brothers themselves. These guys talk for ages and don't have any animation as they do. Now, it was very rare for any of the characters to have animation while they spoke, so it doesn't come that much as a shock to me. But it feels completely different when you watch two characters talking back and forth to each other with no emotion at all. It gives you nothing to look at during these long stretches of dialogue, and it only gets more apparent the further you go into the game. When we're dismissed, Toadster asks us to follow him in search for three elevator parts all around this level of the facility. During this, we see the return of the Mim- <clears throat> I mean Mr. Kebab Man, as we do a Ban Ban signature collect items throughout the room puzzle, this time with tickets. Just the usual padding stuff, which is mostly egregious, we get the memo by now. Though another detail detail I would like to point out are these wanted posters of all the characters you'll see on the walls, with each one having the bounty price of 1 million pan coins, which I feel like isn't fair because I think it would be much easier to capture Captain Fiddles over someone like Jumbo Josh, but whatever. It's time to head into the ventilation sector. In this room, we finally learn the name of the jester, which is Bitter Giggle. I feel like they could have chosen a better name for this guy, but whatever. I've been desensitized to Huggy Wuggy for more than a year now, so sure, Bitter Giggle. We do another puzzle that involves us utilizing the appealing. Keep in mind the fact that we're using the appealing in a puzzle again for later. We open the door with two switches and the drone, and go into this dark room where the door mysteriously closes on us. Although Toadster tells us to stay put, a light turns on, leading to this interaction. Hi! I'm a hungry snake. Do you have any food? <laughs> His waddle is so funny, dude. This is our first, but certainly not last introduction to Bitter Giggle. I'll talk more about him later, but escaping the room leads us to Toadster straight up just chucking a throwing star into Bitter Giggle's chest while delivering the hardest line this series has had to date. But after that, we move on. Yeah, there really wasn't much of a point into going into this room. We go into this area with a bunch of vents that we need to safely get across or Nab Nab is going to get us. To know where to and where not to walk, we need to hold the peeling out. If it squeaks, we have to try a different opening. It's like a Euphoric Brothers signature to have some pretty neat puzzles at the very start of their games to then just have it devolve as you go further on, because I actually kinda like this one. It's kinda creative, and 
it allows us to utilize this appealing that they've been really pushing to be an integral part of the game so far, so I'm good with it. I'm glad that they're actually trying to do more variety that isn't absolutely awful. Getting to the end of this section, we find our first elevator part we needed to grab. Now, we have to walk all the way back to the elevator to put it away. You, like, don't realize how long these areas can stretch out until you have to walk right through them without doing anything interesting. Though, another thing I do want to briefly mention is that it seems like the brothers have updated the lighting engine in this one. I don't know, everything just looks a lot more reflective in this chapter, and there's a lot of examples of this. Finally making our way back to the elevator, we drop the part off, and with it, most of our party members too. Yes, even the appealing. That room that we did with the vents just mere moments before? Yeah, that's the last time this character will be utilized in anything useful again. I don't know why the brothers do this. You introduce something that's pretty different and fresh from the other chapters, and then just abandon it as quickly as you introduced it. Like, this is something that took heavy spotlight in the trailer. I was expecting to have to do puzzles with this guy for the entire game. It's just so bizarre to me that they introduced something like this just for it to be used so little. But whatever, I probably should just refrain from questioning what goes on in these two's heads. Abandoning our party, we go to talk to Queen Bouncelia again, who gives us a blue key card and tells us to visit the infirmary as a new friend has apparently arrived. Going to the infirmary like she suggested, we meet up with our good old friend. When the queen mentioned having many visitors in one day, I knew it had to be you. Why does your head move like that? Briefly talking with Ban Ban, we party up with him to get the second elevator piece. But that's not the only person we meet back up again. Stinger Flynn is back, and we have a little chat with him, before he does one of his patented Stinger Flynn mind tricks on us. Now, these have a tendency to be absolutely insane, but I thought it couldn't get any more crazy than the one in the car. I wish that naive boy still existed. Now, you probably already know what happens at the end of this cutscene, so I also want to pay more light to the other things that happen here, such as Stinger Flynn having an existential crisis while talking to the rest of the cast. How is any being able to move past constant sorrow in a world like ours? Sometimes I feel like we're all just doomed forever. We each have our plans and goals, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Nor can it undo the past or previous misery. Life is too short to be sad all the time, Stinger. Our lives are in. I am still absolutely befuddled on why the brothers put this here. Is this like a personal commentary? Is one of the brothers personally venting out their frustrations through Stinger goddamn Flynn? Maybe, but we don't have much time to question that. For as soon as this exchange ends, this happens. Help me! <sighs> yeah, this is probably the highlight of the entire chapter. Choo choo tarvos? Why is he here? Like, genuinely, why is he here? This moment obviously took me by surprise, as it probably has with literally everyone who's played this game. But what does this mean in context with literally everything we know about Ban Ban? Does this imply that Choo Choo Charles is also some sort of strange Givanium creature? I don't know, man. It's too much of a headache to process. If they come back to this idea again in the future, I might respect it depending on how they handle it. But as of right now, I'm just left absolutely befuddled. Though, it did get a reaction out of me at least. Waking up from our patented stinger nap, we get back onto the tram where Ban Ban is waiting for us. We have some exposition dumped on us while we head to the next station to pick up our next elevator part. But on our way, Ban Ban goes on this dialogue about his origin a bit, revealing that he was an ex-worker of the facility before something went terribly wrong and he turned into Ban Ban. This was explained ages ago through the notes in Chapter 2, but I guess the brother found it appropriate to disclose up front now that we're on chapter 4. Arriving at our next stop, we gotta do a puzzle to open two doors to the next area we need to get to. This puzzle utilizing the drone, which has thankfully taken a heavy backseat this game. And honestly, if I were to give this game another compliment, is that when the drone does need to be used, the puzzles that it's done with this time around are honestly kinda 
of clever. Obviously, they're still just having to open a bunch of doors with miscellaneous and pointless buttons, but I do like rooms like these, where you actually have to angle your drone at the other side of the wall to hit buttons that are conventionally out of range. Hopefully, future band bands will keep drone usage to a minimum like this as well, or at least try to be a little more creative with the idea. Though, down here, you can also take a little detour into this room with a bunch of different colored jesters, one of which is voiced by Think Noodles. Don't listen to that guy over there. All he cares about are his poems. You know, the guy who does Let's Plays, but he's like a cat emoji VTuber. I mean, he at least seems better than Lanky Box. That's all I'm gonna say. There's also this blue and pink jester in a tube, which looks super oddly familiar to this fan design my buddy Aya made with the inspiration being of my other friend David Barron's character. It's most likely a coincidence, but I still think it's really amusing. Making our way back upstairs, Ban Ban finally explains why he picked up the mimic before we got here. And and to my knowledge, it seems like so we could drop it off for Zolfius. But this kind of gesture is rudely interrupted by Nab Nab, who we have to chase to get our mimic back. Cornering him in a room, we bear witness to the craziest fight scene known to man. I tried fixing you so many times that you are just unfixable. Enough is enough. Since Ban Ban lit that demon out of him, he needs to rest as we painstakingly take our second elevator piece back to Toadster. It's not entirely in vain though, as after talking to Bouncelia again, we learned that more friends have arrived to the infirmary. Toadster left little notes that we can listen to about the characters that do a little bit of world building, which I think is pretty neat. Once again, his characterization has actually been pretty nice, given how shallow most of the Ban Ban cast is. As we make our way to the final sector of the facility to get our last piece, we get to quite possibly the worst part of the game. We go to the employee exercise sector, where we are put through various cognitive trials, starting with one where we basically need to play a ban ban version of observation duty. And if you watched a few of my old videos, you'd probably know that this part was going to be absolutely miserable for me. I'm awful at memory games, so I spent over 15 minutes in this section alone trying to figure out exactly how this part worked. The thing about most Spot the Difference games is that the landscape you're looking at is usually static instead of being something you need to continuously explore. This puzzle falls apart for that reason, and I found it to be really unfair at times. But I can acknowledge this was probably just a skill issue on my part, as my second playthrough of this area didn't take me nearly as long. Though I will stand by my belief and say that it lasts for way too long. Two rounds would have been fine, but having to do this six times, meaning three rounds in total was way too much in my opinion. But we're getting pretty close to the end, so that means the brothers clearly needed to throw in something to pad out time. Although, this next part I cannot excuse for simply just being incredibly poorly designed. Our little jester fella does his signature waddle out of the scene as we gaze upon what is quite possibly the worst design to come out of this series so far. It is insane how this was chosen to be the final design. This model is so very clearly built off the base of a stock T-Rex that it's actually painful to look at. I haven't even fact-checked if this is actually a stock model base yet, but I guarantee it is. Editing me, pull up a screenshot of the base in the model credits, please. Thank you. This boss fight is also just so obtuse and not fun to do. The hitbox of Kitty Saurus is absolutely absurd and does not feel fair at all 90% of the time. It feels like you're more likely to be hit by going to its side rather than the front of it. The concept of this boss fight is also just so fundamentally flawed too. You have to step on one of these buttons on the floor to turn one of the buttons on the walls red. When you do this, you need to then position yourself in just the right order to have Kitty Saurus ram into the button, which feels like it only works like 70% of the time, if that. You know what would have possibly made this boss fight more dynamic and fun though? The use of the appealing to call 
recall which button you want it to go to. Instead of doing this absolutely dire manual back and forth from going from each button to the next, being able to call the appealing to whatever button you wanted to run to would make lining up your shots so much easier as well. And I honestly think it would also make it more skill-based too. But instead, we have to run this thing for a loop several times, which could take ages if you even slightly aligned yourself poorly. Not even to mention that for some reason, the button you hit activates the barrier opposite of you, meaning that you need to run to one side to hit the button, have Kitty Soros charge at you, run to the other side to have it charge at you again, and then run back one more time to finally have it hit the correct button. And to top it all off, you had to do this for three more times and hopefully not get caught by its fucking abysmal hitbox. This is such a dire fight that feels like it was not playtested at all. But after some trial and error, I was finally able to get this thing down. Good riddance. Making our way into the room that opens up after, we do a signature ban ban, collect some stuff to get the item puzzle, and enter the last room to get our final elevator piece. Once we do, we're finally met face to face with this chapter's antagonist. Like a bug to a zapper. I won't lie, I thought the dinosaur would finish you off. But if, but if trapping, trapping you will get you out of my way too, then who am I to complain? The voice acting for this character is honestly pretty killer and one of the highlights of this entire game. But obviously, once again, the animations do not do this performance justice whatsoever. The VA sounds like he's giving it their absolute all with this one, while the model just stands there and stares at you the whole time. It's really bizarre. His entire motivation for being a villain is that he wants to tell jokes and that makes him a bad guy. Honestly, this is just so incredibly silly. But hey, at least it's an amusing motive, which I guess is ironic in its own right. But I refuse to give the Euphoric Brothers that much credit, so I'm just going to continue believing that this is just an incredibly stupid motive. Breaking out of the room we were locked in, we make our way back to the kingdom one last time as we watch Bitter Giggle confront Bounce Selena. Going up to the confrontation as well triggers this insane ass cutscene. For some reason, our baby Opeeling is standing on the roof with Bounce Celia as well, and as she jumps down, this dude just straight up falls into Gavanium. This was my live reaction to this moment. It was not real. No! 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 Are you serious? No! No! Oh my god! No! No! This is the only time we see this design, by the way. It's so weird to me how they went through the efforts of making this really badass model, cold open with it in the trailer, and then give it less than 10 seconds of screen time. This thing was so cool, man. I really hope they do more of it in the future because they did not give this thing justice. While our now mutated appealing keeps Kitty Soros occupied, Bitter Giggle finally pulls the trigger on his joke, which in turn leads this to happen. Toadster meets up behind us, and the most anticlimactic chase scene the series has had up until this point plays out. Though, once we get to the elevator, we meet up with an unconscious Stinger Flynn, riding down with the two as the chapter ends. The tonal whiplash this chapter has given me every 15 minutes is something I still have not recovered from. Taking a minute at the end here, I want to talk about this very bizarre structure the brothers are seemingly taking regarding the future chapters of this game as well. Now, with the release of every new Ban Ban game, the brothers usually put the page up for the next game so you can go wishlist it right after you play. But when this game went up, both the pages for Garden of Ban Ban 5 and 6 were put up on Steam. With everything pointing to 6 being the direct continuation of 4, and 5 being some weird side story where we go back to the original location with some static filter over everything. I am very confused on what this can actually mean going forward, but I'm still incredibly intrigued, I guess. This game had a lot of ups and downs, but I'd say this is still a major improvement over 3. Was it worth being priced an extra $10 more than the last two games? No, absolutely not. 
I'd honestly refrain from buying it for that reason if it doesn't go on sale. But once again, it feels like the brothers are taking little baby steps in the right direction. The new voices they got for hire did an amazing job, and the environments are starting to look a little better and more unique too. But I'm afraid that this slow improvement may start to plateau in the next coming installments. And since they're obviously not stopping at 5 like these games usually do, I just hope that they don't get too stagnant in the future. But all in all, the game was at the very least entertaining. And that's really all I can ask out of Ban Ban at this point. In conclusion, they finally optimized the Droner mode. We did it, guys. Ban Ban has now officially been fixed. Peak is restored. I have been Dags, and until next time, see ya.